Good morning, everybody. Instant quiet. This is great. <laughs> Uh, my name is Amy Rowe Miller, and I am the SOA president, and I would like to welcome you all to day two of our very first ever hybrid conference. So good to see you all in person, and uh, hopefully there are a lot of you all online, but it's also good to virtually see you. Welcome to Dayton and the Dayton Metro Library. I would like to thank our hosts uh, for welcoming us into this amazingly beautiful space. This is a pretty recently renovated library. I grew up here and I remember the big modernist box of my childhood and it is nothing like that now. Um, so during networking time, please take some time to go explore, especially the Dayton room up on the second floor with its special collections. A couple quick housekeeping notes. We have snacks and coffee in the back for networking time. This is also where you'll pick up your lunch. There are restrooms right outside this room. If you go out the door, you'll see the sign there on your left. And then there are also restrooms up on the second floor right outside the community room where we will be. I would also like to thank our sponsors for helping to make this conference possible. The Kent State University School of Information, Archival Methods, the Society of American Archivists, and Case Western Reserve University's Kelvin Smith Library as well as our scholarship sponsors, Ohio Link and Preserve It LLC. I would also like to thank our wonderful silent auction donors, the Cincinnati Reds, the Dayton Art Institute, Dayton Dragons, Kent State University, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Society of American Archivists, Square One Salon and Spa, the Ohio State University, the Works, Western Reserve Historical Society, and Young's Jersey Dairy. And you can find all of the wonderful silent auction items up on the balcony right where Melissa is sitting now. And bidding will be open on those until about 1.15. We would not have a conference today if it were not for the hard work of our educational programming committee who have been working on this all year, tackling our first ever hybrid experience and making it a wonderful success so far. Um, as well as making the local arrangements. Um, so if you are on the Educational Program Committee, uh, please stand and be applauded. I would especially like to thank our two co-chairs, Matt Francis and Adam Wanter for their leadership in making this happen. So if we could give them a special round of applause. Uh, and finally, I would also like to thank Betsy Hedler, our Ohio History Connection liaison, um, who has been responsible for doing all of the logistics and registration wrangling for making this happen. So if we could also get a round of applause for Betsy. All right, so our theme this year is Forward Together, Community Partnerships and Public Service. And I think this is a particularly appropriate one as we all move forward in the aftermath of COVID now that the public health emergency has officially come to an end. Where do we go from here? Uh, and I think the sessions yesterday and today do a really good job exploring different forms and ideas that partnerships and public service can take um, from the very formal like the National Aviation Heritage Area, which we will hear about in a moment from our first keynote, um, to the very informal, like all of the networking and connecting with colleagues that has been happening since we all got here this morning. And on that note, I would like to introduce our first morning keynote speaker, Mackenzie Wetner. Mackenzie is the Executive Director of the National Aviation Heritage Alliance. The Alliance is the management entity of the National Aviation Heritage Area, one of 62 national heritage areas designated by Congress as having a cohesive, distinctive landscape of historic and cultural resources of national importance. The National Aviation Heritage Area shares our nation's aviation story, sustaining the legacy of the Wright brothers and all men, women, and flying machines that changed our world. <laughs> Mrs. Whitmer works closely with the National Park Service, the National Museum of the United States Air Force, 
other aviation heritage organizations, and numerous informal partners to leverage cultural heritage as an economic catalyst in the region. She serves on the Wright Dunbar Inc. Board of Trustees, an economic development group in Dayton, and also serves as a volunteer and trustee for the Dayton Metro Library Foundation. In 2022, Governor DeWine appointed McKenzie to the America 250 Ohio Commission, a celebration of 250 years of the United States in 2026. And side note, we have a session about that later this afternoon if you want to learn more. She is currently a <laughs> she is currently a member of the Wright Patterson Air Force Base Honorary Commanders Program, a 2021 graduate of Leadership Ohio, and a 2020 2016 graduate of Leadership Dayton. She graduated from Miami University with a bachelor's degree in history and political science and from Wright State University with a master's degree in public history. Yeah, you're all here. Woo! <laughs> she has served in her current role since August 2018 and has been with the organization since 2014. Welcome, Mackenzie. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. We have made it or almost made it. Um, I need just a second to figure out what's happening up here so I can minimize. I'm, I am going to minimize this chat. Okay. And I think I will go off my slideshow. Thank you for your patience as I uh, get used to, and I found the clicker. So I think I'm good. Perfect. Are you guys okay in the back? I've never been told that I'm actually quiet. <laughs> I, I I told Adam I didn't really need this. Okay. Well, again, thank you. It is my pleasure to be with you today at the Society of Ohio Archivists annual meeting. Welcome to Dayton. I hope that today is full of learning and full of fun for you. You know, whether you are at home in your PJs or whether you're here today at the Dayton Metro Library. My goals are to share a little bit about what the National Aviation Heritage Area is and the work that it carries out. And I'd like to share a few examples of community partnerships and public service. And I want to particularly highlight some examples that draw on archives and collections. My hope is that these examples will inspire you to either start a community partnership strategy or to continue your current strategy on behalf of your organization. So before I get started, I'm going to see where I need to point my clicker. Or I could click it here on my myself. It's mm. because you not trying. Because you clicked out of the Zoom. Magic. All right, before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about my personal career journey um, and the connection that it has to the work that you do. In the late 1990s, I worked at the Dayton Art Institute. Where are my DAI people? There you are. I see you. Um, so picture this. It was the 90s. I was rocking my corduroys and my Doc Martens in my middle part. And I know that you can picture that because that's what we look like today. Um, but I had a job in the development office. And one of my challenges was to organize a museum-wide software system to bring in the work of the different departments. So you can imagine this. Over here, you have the development department where you have a donor or a member. And then down the hall, there's the marketing office and they have people who are coming to the museum. Uh, attendance numbers, exhibit openings, special events. And then upstairs on the second floor, there's the education department. And that same person might be buying adult education or son signing people up for summer camps. And then I never had a key card to get into curatorial, but there was also the curatorial department where their number one priority is taking care of that collection. But many of those artworks were donated by people or families that still were in the Dayton community. So it was really impossible to have a full picture 
of what someone's involvement in the museum was as we continue to operate in these silos. Does this resonate with any of your organizations? I'm seeing nods, I could hear an amen out there. Okay, um, so it was my pleasure to work with the museum archivist. And I don't see her here today. She has moved on to a different organization, but she knows this story and she knows the impact that it had on my life and my career journey. So going into the archives of the Dayton Art Institute was amazing. I loved it. Not only was she professional and skilled and helpful and kind, but she had the, as the records retention manager of the organization, she had the pieces of the puzzle to help me solve my problem. Well, of course I wanted her job. <laughs> And so she quickly told me that if I wanted to do a job like that, I needed to go to Wright State. Now, we've already had a shout out for Wright State, but let's do it again. Where are my Wright State graduates? Okay, for those of you online, it's a lot of us. <laughs> and it, it's awesome because I see so many familiar faces out here. I went through that program. I love the program, every minute of it. I was working at Wright State. I was doing my master's in public history. And... It was my mentor and teacher who led me to, who told me about the heritage area and helped me secure my first role at the organization. And I share my career journey for two points because many of you don't know me. And I wanted to say that I'm not just some rando. I, a random person up here who does not understand your work. I may not know your latest issues, your emerging trends, but I, I see you and I value your work and I want you to know that you are critical to your communities and thank, and thank you for the work that you do. I also share that because I wanna remind you as you carry out your community partnership strategy, not everyone will be able to envision the role you can play. You have to tell them. And furthermore, Oops, that changed my slide. Sorry, I thought I was doing my notes. Um, furthermore, you may not know exactly the role you can play in a community partnership. I'm going to move to my paper slides so I can go this way. Okay. So I encourage you, um, as you explore the idea of community partnerships, to look for opportunities to listen to your community and your potential partners to make real connections, take risks, experiment, fail, and all those things. So I'm not an archivist. I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about uh, you know, finding aids and scopes of collections and all those things, but it's nice to be here with you today to talk about partnerships. So I wanna move on and tell you a little bit about what the National Aviation Heritage Area is and the work that it carries out. You may notice that from my bio, I'm the executive director of the National Aviation Heritage Alliance, and it has the exact same acronym as the heritage area, because someone in 2004 was super smart, and we can just all call it NAHA. So if you hear me fall into my insider language, which I will try to avoid, and you hear this word, NAHA, I'm talking about either the alliance or the heritage area, and if it matters, which is which, I'll try to point that out. So what is a heritage area? Well, I'm gonna to read to you the official definition because it is better than anything that I can ad lib up here. And you've already heard it once, so now you're gonna hear it twice because you heard it in my bio. National heritage areas are designated by Congress for their unique nationally significant qualities and resources. It is a place where a combination of natural, cultural, historic, and recreation resources have shaped a cohesive, nationally distinctive landscape. It tells a national story. What does that mean? Well, it means that in 2004, Congress introduced and passed a piece of legislation to designate an eight county region as the National Aviation Heritage Area. That is because the assets that tell the story were already here. The Air Force Museum, Carillon Park, Wright State Special Collections and Archives. Those assets were already here to tell the nationally significant story. A heritage area is created 
to help form community partnerships to leverage the collective story. And as Amy shared in the bio, or as she was introducing, it is a very formal type of partnership. It is funded and staffed. So um, what that means is that Congress designates, and that designation will never go away. There will not be another national aviation heritage area in Seattle or North Carolina. It is here and that does not expire. But, but Congress does authorize and reauthorize the management entity to continue the work. And then we are subject to annual federal appropriations. So I am gonna tell you a little bit about the heritage area system. Now, I do not expect you to be able to read anything on this map. I, it is a nightmare. And for those of you who are on screen, you're like, hey, I made the right choice today. Um, not just for the PJs, but I wanted to give it because I think that even if you're in that back row, you can probably see the colors of the map and you can get a sense where the 62 national heritage areas are in the United States. There are, like I said, 62 heritage areas across 36 states and one U.S. territory. Does anyone, anyone want to guess the U.S. territory? It's actually not on this map because it just got designated in December. Anyone want to name a U.S. territory? Yeah. That would be amazing. It's not. <laughs> Let's get one started. Um, it is actually in St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And yes, I am pushing for our annual meeting to be there in the future. <laughs> uh, two weeks ago, it was in Alabama, which was still great. Still great. So you're seeing a couple different things here on this map. I want you to know that heritage areas were created in the 80s under the Ronald Reagan administration as one tool to bring federal resources into a region as an economic catalyst. And it was organized under the National Park Service. So the first heritage areas really represent uh, regions that had experienced a loss in the 80s of manufacturing jobs related to globalization, changing industry, all the things of the 80s that you guys might know if you've got stuff in your collections about the 80s. Um, but it, it's also, this map is also a reflection of two other things. It's a, a reflection of changes over time. Um, in the most recent years, we've had more heritage areas emerge on the West Coast. And it's also a reflection of powerful congressional leaders. Um, for those up front, you might already say like, why in the world does West Virginia have four heritage areas? Well, they had a really strong senator. Um, his name was Robert Byrd. He built bridges. He brought tons of resources into West Virginia, and he championed three of the heritage areas in West Virginia. So we could talk all day about politics and all the stuff, but I want you to just kind of see where the heritage areas are and um, know a little bit about how they came about and um, you know how that all worked. So let's play a game because you've all had your coffee or your scone or whatever, the, the breakfast was delicious. Okay, so I just told you that these heritage areas emerged in areas that had experienced economic loss. Okay, shout it out. There's no raising of hands. Where is Motor Cities? Detroit. Absolutely. Where is Rivers of Steel? Detroit. Man, you guys are so smart. National Coal Heritage Area, Virginia. West Virginia. Now there's a lot, there, there could be a lot of options, right? But picture, and actually there's one in Colorado called South Park that also does some mining stories. But you can kind of, um, you know, picture that, that that would fit for West Virginia. Okay. Cane River National Heritage Area. Louisiana. How did you know that? Who said that? that was you? Are you from Louisiana? <laughs> Wait, okay. I'm afraid to go back to the map because I'm afraid of this clicker. How in the world did you see that dot? Yeah. It's this dot. <laughs> <laughs> You're amazing. You know what? You should be an archivist. <laughs> I'll, I'll think about it. Okay, okay. 
Well, so Cane River is one parish in Louisiana sharing um, the history of Creole architecture. All right. I did put Niagara Falls on the game for a reason, but trick question, not where it is, but what's the industry that left the region? Hydroelectric power. And then my last one is silos and smokestacks. Okay, you saw it on the map. Did you see where it was? I, I didn't see all of them. Okay, all right, all right. He's raising his hands. He's raising his hands, but he, he can't see it. Any guesses? I'm sorry? Good guess. I, did I hear Iowa? Hey, you're right. Silos and smokestacks telling our national story of agriculture. It's my favorite because I really like to eat and they talk a lot about food. <laughs> All right. So sorry for the very bad image. I was working on this yesterday. It's a little blurry, but I wanted to show you a zoom in of Ohio because we have two heritage areas in Ohio. Is there anyone here who has partnered with Ohio and Erie Canal a National Heritage Area? I looked at the roster yesterday and I didn't see, but if you have colleagues and friends um, know that Ohio and Erie Canal Way has partnered with Western Reserve Historical Society, Cleveland State University, and they actually have a really cool project going on right now called the Cleveland Green Book Project. And it's in partnership with Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And there's a, a Mellon fellow there to, to carry out that work. So that's really great. So it also kind of shows you the, geogra the geography of Ohio and where the two heritage areas are in our state. All right, I am a couple pages behind, so I am going to move forward. So specifically about the National Aviation Heritage Area, our mission is to preserve and develop the assets of the National Aviation Heritage Area and promote the heritage and future of aerospace. This comes straight from our legislation. Our legislation defines our purpose. What does that really look like? It looks like we do some promotion of the collective whole of the region. We do some preservation projects in the heritage area and we do some advocacy. And I'll talk a little bit more about all three of those. And I just would remind you again that our legislation defined our purpose and our work because the assets that form that landscape were already here. It was my job to come in for the job of the heritage area and I get the pleasure of working for it, the heritage area to set the table for all of those partners to work together for the benefit of the entire region. So here's a close up of the Ohio counties. So if you work in one of these counties. I met someone today from Warren County. Um, if you work in one of these counties and you have collections and projects and partnerships related to aviation heritage, um, I want to talk to you. Let's, let's meet by the coffee after this presentation. Um, our legislation defines our eight counties as our legislative core. However, we do work with the 45 aviation heritage assets that are across Ohio. Some of them might be in your communities. In addition to working with assets across Ohio, we work with the 61 other heritage areas. Right now we're working on a National Park Foundation grant. Um, it's an inclusive storytelling grant where we're doing 250 um, researched articles and stories um, in preparation for America 250, which you will hear about later today, not from me, uh, for 2026. So, you know, working together across the, across the states. And in addition to that, we also work with our North Carolina partners. We work with some partners in Wisconsin for a large air show. And we even work with our city of Dayton with some sister city relationships that are tied to aviation heritage. So we have a lot of partners, um, but I'm gonna show you another slide. These are our designated partners. And this is defined by having a seat on our board of trustees. These are the organizations that when um, incorporated were defined as the assets that were already here. And you can see a summer camp experience. You can see, you know, it's the Air Force Museum Foundation because the Air Force Museum itself is a federal entity. Um, you can see nonprofits, you can see travel and tourism groups, and then you can see Wright State Special Collections and Archives. Um, I don't know if you noticed it, There's, it's right here. 
Now it might be the last alphabetically, but it's not the last in my heart, not last place. All right. So um, in addition to designated partners, I had shared with you that we have an organizational structure that advances partnerships and collaboration. And we have this built in to how we do our everyday work. And so those designated partners that I just showed you a slide for, they all have a seat on the board of trustees. So while there are also members at large, there are people in this room who sit on the board that I report to, and the opportunity is to connect and work across organizations. In addition to board leadership, the executive leadership at those partners also re meet regularly. We meet quarterly. And at the executive leadership team, we're talking about strategy, um, you know, high level topics at organizations around staffing. You know, of course, we went through COVID together and, and all of that. And then our organizational structure also has um, committees where our marketing, the mar paid marketing and PR staff of all the organizations, including all eight CVBs and some informal partners meet bi-monthly. We just had a meeting last week and we advanced projects together as a whole. And I'll tell some examples of that. So this is really, a, it's a funded staffed community partnership organization. We also have informal partners. Has anyone here been to the Airstream Heritage Center and factory tour? I see one, two. Guys, it's amazing. It's so beautiful. They opened it last year. Um, it, and I don't know if Samantha was part of this group. Um, she she uh, just left me to go to Colorado. But we have informal partners who are also telling this aviation heritage story. And, and these are maybe they're one-off one -off experiences like Shelby County Historical Society. They had a, part, a project last year. I might not have another project with them for another five or 10 years. So I don't have a, that is more of a, a fluid situation and both can be successful. We also partner with some regional um, groups. I, I have Dayton Metro Library on here because in 2019, the summer reading program was Apollo themed. So we leaned into that and supported their summer reading challenge. Okay, so let me get into a little bit of the weeds, but I also want to be mindful of my time that how do we carry out the work? So one way that we carry out this work is through our subgrant program. So we use our federal funds to identify projects that are, they could be preservation, collections, exhibits, aircraft maintenance. These are just examples, marketing, promotion. And let's see, um, just out of very briefly, like here's an example of a partnership at Woodland Cemetery over here on the, the edge of the screen. That was a partnership between Woodland, Garden Club of Dayton, Siebenthalers, and the Heritage Area to re-landscape around the Wright Brothers gravesite. In the middle is Wright B. Flyer. They are building a new airplane. They take that airplane to parades and the Dayton Air Show. And so the partnership with them has been a one-to-one -one helping them with materials and supplies to keep building that airplane. And then um, Armstrong Air and Space, another great partner. Several years ago, we funded them to get the trailer to take their lunar rover to different partners for educational programs. And then recently we funded the vehicle wraps. Gotta catch up again. All right. You know, I did when I was thinking about the subgrants and I was trying to think about how I could relate this to your work as you look to engage in um, community partnerships, if this is something that you guys wanna lean into, you know, you are the repository for all the partnerships that need to come do their historical research, right? You have the imagery, you have, you know, if it's a placemaking project, you can create something that's different than another community because you have the unique authentic stories. Um, we also have a special project fund. These are one-time projects that seed different efforts. They can be education. I 
picked three art projects because they make a better slide than like a feasibility study or an assessment. Um, I know that you guys look at paper a lot and you know what I'm saying, like sometimes you just want a good picture. Uh, so uh, these are just, I won't, you know, we've funded murals um, when there was the Mars effort that Carolyn Park was a part of a couple years ago. Um, we did some graphic imagery around that and the right company factory, which was a, a, a mural commissioned art project. All right. We also do collective promotion. And you can imagine this, you know, the Air Force Museum is always gonna have their marketing and their PR. They're doing a centennial this year. You know, Carillon Park is always gonna have their marketing and their PR for their attraction. So the heritage area has to come in behind them and say, how can we promote the collective whole? How can we work together? And sometimes that's, you know, um, group advertising. Uh, making sure we share that there's more to do than just one attraction in this region. It also can mean working with the Ohio Department of Transportation on brown and white signs because it's easier to work with one person than 18. And we do National Park Service cancellation stamps. Like if you can picture those little, I see some smiles in the audience. Um, all of the heritage area sites have cancellation stamps because we're a system of the National Park Service. We also do social media and itineraries, and we le lean kind of heavily into that travel tourism world because we want people to come here and learn. I also wanted to take just a brief moment to talk about advocacy because when I was thinking about the Society of Ohio Archivists and how you might be thinking about your role in community engagement strategies, Advocacy is a place that's an easy, easy one to start with. So here's an example. If you're from the Dayton area, you know that this sculpture was along Riverscape. Um, the property sold, it had to be um, relocated. And I had partners who wanted it to be relocated in the neighborhood called Wright Dunbar, which holds the national park here in Dayton. And so what adv advocacy can look like is just letters of support. And so when I was thinking about you guys, I was thinking like, when I need help, I want to come to my partners who are similar to your organizations, because you, as the memory keepers, your support holds weight. And this is my covert way of asking Jane to do letters of support for me. <laughs> <laughs> but this is also a way that you can engage. You might not have the budget, staff, time, but if you wanna get engaged with your community partnerships, offering a letter of support for their project is a great first step. Here in the Dayton region, we have an official process to rank community projects, it's called the priority develop, I mean, you don't care, it's called PDAC. But if you are from Columbus, I would look at your, the, the group that is out of the Jobs Ohio map, it's called One Columbus, I believe, there's Team Neo in Northeast Ohio. Look at what they're ranking, look at what the community as a whole is advancing and see if there's correlations to your collections, your themes. It's a, a really easy way to get started in the, the advocacy role of community partnerships. I have one more slide on advocacy because we do some, some state and federal advocacy as well. So this is an image of the Paul Lawrence Dunbar House. There's a lot of federal money flowing right now. And I'm sure that you're hearing from your listservs the organizations that you're involved in that there is opportunities, whether it's through you know, NEH or Ohio Humanities. These are great opportunities to look for partnerships across your community because you might not have, actually that's not true. Your collections are worthy of these fundings but they're looking for partnerships. They're looking for unusual collaborations. And so I would encourage you to keep your eye on that money. And um, I, the reason I put the Paul Lawrence Dunbar House on here is that earmarks are currently part of our congressional um, plan. 
And the organization that I worked for did receive an earmark for a Save America's Treasures grant for this, this partnership. Um, we're doing some preservation work at this house. There are some OHC people here. Where are my OHC people? Oh, the guy who knew the map. <laughs> so I'm working with the facilities department um, to carry out that Save America's grant. So that's a little bit about advocacy. Happy to take questions or talk later about um, how to work with elected officials or how, how to uh, lean forward in advocacy. I do want to briefly share two examples. Um, maybe, okay, who in this room has read this book? I have not read this book because it feels like work. <laughs> um, so a couple of years ago, David McCullough, actually more than a couple of years ago now, um, released this book. And our friends and partners at Wright State Special Collections and Archives were the authority, they, the, the research place that he used to help write his book. And Wright State had tremendous opportunities with David McCullough and that picture above also includes Tom Hanks in their archives. But they also shared that opportunity across the partnerships. So we see David McCullough in the lower picture touring other sites outside of Wright State. The heritage area was able to lean in and do some promotion about his coming. We hosted a lecture, um, a, a public lecture for him to speak at. Um, we did some filming while he was here. And that's because the team was generous. And that's a great way to start a, a partnership, to not think necessarily about what you need, but what you can give. And I, I thank and commend Wright State Special Collection Archive for being so generous. This is the Wright Company factory. And I'm going to look very closely at my time because I can talk about this all day. The Wright Company factory is in West Dayton. It was constructed in 1910, 1911. Since 2004, community partners have been working to put the right company factory into the national park to be acquired by the national park. This picture shows you five arches. The first two arches on my right um, are the historic hangars that the Wright brothers used. They are the first purpose-built structures for the aviation industry. And don't you love first? It's all about how you word it. So let me say that again, because I said it wrong. The first purpose-built buildings in the United States for the aviation industry. And in 2004, a piece of legislation called for a feasibility study. That study was executed. And in 2009, the structure was put into the boundary of the national park. Being in the boundary doesn't mean that they own it. It's owned by the city of Dayton. And so the National Park Service has been working for a number of years, having been funded in 2018 with the money needed to execute the acquisition process. I want to say and share with you that one of the resources that has proved invaluable to this process to me and others is the Wright Brothers Collection at Wright State Special Collections and Archives. They have a collection of Wright factory images. So between that resource and the Library of Congress, we have been able to execute the work that calls for the acquisition. Most recently, the National Park Service completed a historic structures report. If you have ever been part of an organization that has a historic structures report, report you know that you can do some weightlifting with those uh, books. They're usually about a ream of paper. It's about a $300,000 project and it took about three years. But because we have the resources, and this is an example, and I want you to be thinking about your own collections and how you can help your community projects. Um, it, was, it was invaluable because we know exactly what the structure looked like. On March 26th at 3.30 a.m., the structure caught on fire. I had a friend call me at, it was a, I'd call it Sunday morning, Saturday night. 
um, and a friend who is um, is married to the fire marshal called me and said, the factory's on fire and it's bad. It's really bad. And so you may have seen this in the news. Um, you know, because of our relationship and our partnerships, we've been able to elevate this story to a national level. It's been, it was picked up by AP, it was in the New York Times, it was in the Washington Post. And I use this picture from the Dayton Daily News because I think it really, if you can see that from the back, it really shows the devastation. It shows that the historic exterior that faces the West is standing, but bulging. Maybe you can't see the bulging. You can't see the spalling on the bricks. You can't see the loss of paint. You can't see that this wall needs to be shored up because it might fall with a strong wind. But you can see how the steel trust support system behind is collapsed. You can see that the roof is gone. And this is a fascinating project because you guys have to deal with questions like this all the time too, right? When does something that has historic, high historic integrity, when it suffers a loss, when you suffer a loss, maybe you've had a flood or maybe something else has happened in your facilities and you've had a loss, when does that loss get so bad that it changes the direction of the project? We don't know. We don't know what's happening, um, where the direction of this project will be. I will say that um, at 3.30 on Saturday night, Sunday morning, um, National Park Service law enforcement went to the site and started taking pictures. And then within a couple hours, we had some park partners out there doing drone photography of the fire. And since then, we've had some additional photography and um, documentation because now the fire is part of the story. So the investigation of how the fire started is ongoing. We don't know exactly how a building that didn't really have much to burn burned. And we don't know the pathway forward for this structure. But we will continue to work with the city of Dayton and the National Park Service and the Dayton Metro Library, which has a branch at that site, and other partners, including a private developer, for a good outcome. I am thankful for the archives and collections that will help us continue to move forward with this project now that we've experienced a devastating loss. So wrapping up, how do you get here? How do you get to a fluid, exciting um, environment of collaborations and community partnerships? How do you get that person to call you and say, I've got a crazy idea. Will you talk to me about it? I mean, that's where I wanna be. If you've got a crazy idea, remember I'm gonna be by the cookies later. Um, I would say, don't wait, don't wait to be consulted. I think often sometimes those requests come in. I would encourage you to be proactive, to go out there and look for opportunities. You know, if you're wishing to be part of something, just go join it. You don't need a heritage area. You don't need this formal structure. You know, I'd start by joining, go find your people, go find, I mean, these are your people. What can you guys do together? You know, if you are in leadership at your organization, I would encourage you to empower your staff to go and engage at a genuine level across um, organizations, you know, and to take every reasonable opportunity that aligns with your, with your organizational goals. So some things that I'm thinking about in 2023 that maybe you're thinking about too, and maybe you wanna chit chat about, I am thinking about the National Museum of the United States Air Force's centennial. Um, pleased to be part of that. We are also celebrating a centennial in Troy, Ohio at Waco Air Museum, um, celebrating 100 years of Waco aircraft in Troy, Ohio. We will continue to advance the partnership around the Wright Company factory. I previously mentioned the partnership around the Paul Lawrence Dunbar Save America's Treasures grant 
I mentioned the inclusive storytelling grant, which I will be carrying out with our designated partners. We're also thinking about the total eclipse. Is there anyone here that's thinking about the eclipse and making, I, okay, one, yeah. Okay, I see a couple hands. Um, great opportunity if your organization is in the path of totality in April of 2024. Uh, as the heritage area, we're also talking about America 250 and America 250 Ohio, Ohio's role in the national celebration in 2026. And then next week, I'm having my first meeting to talk about 2028 and the 125th anniversary of first flight. So these are some additional examples. These are all partnerships. I'm not doing any of this alone. All right. So how do we keep the conversation going? You can tell that I enjoy talking about these topics. I enjoy partnerships. Um, there is no idea too crazy. I just did a jewelry partnership um, a couple of weeks ago with an artist, it was kind of cool. So I, if you're interested in the heritage area, please come talk to me after. If you have a project in preservation, historical research, recreation, Anything with an aviation heritage connection, please come and talk to me. If you are in the Ohio Erie Canal Way uh, footprint, please go talk to them. And thank you for letting me be part of your day. Okay. Well, we're going to open the floor for questions. So, um, and this could be right here. Um, I'll bring the mic to you so that, you know, everyone can hear you. So, yeah. And then, uh, Melissa will ask any online questions, so repeat it so that you can all hear all that fun stuff. Online? Yeah, let's go. Oh, there we go. Any questions? Anyone? Anyone? That's okay, too. There's no judgment in community partnerships. <laughs> All right. You want to tell more stories? I'm fine. I don't, I, I don't think I, I don't know if I have another story to tell. <laughs> okay. Here we go. You could ask me a question about my, my technical expertise on a laptop. That's not my own with a zoom bar across the slide, <laughs> the slides down here. Um, very loud. <laughs> Can you maybe talk a little bit about some, some of the untraditional partnerships, like the jewelry partnership, or like, for instance, I work for a hospital system. Yeah. You know, how did I get involved? Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Well, in Kettering Memorial, there is an exhibit about Charles Kettering, and I was involved in that. Um, I'll tell you about the jewelry one, because that's kind of fun. I'll go, give a plug for the artist. Uh, Around Christmas time, we had an event here in Dayton at the arcade, which is a newly um, redeveloped site that's important to our community. And they have this event called Holidays with, with um, artists. And my best friend went there, I was not there, and she bought me a pair of earrings that were made out of graffiti from the Front Street um, Arts District, which is another part of the Dayton community. And she knew that I would love them and she gave them to me. Well, so I reached out to the artist who has an Instagram presence. It's Riley Street Merchants. And I said, I was given this wonderful gift from my best friend unexpectedly. Um, it really meant a lot to me. I also have a facility that has a lot of graffiti. Would you be interested in coming making art from the right company factory? And so here's something so simple. And it took less than two hours of my time maybe even less than one. Well, we were probably there for an hour. So a couple emails of like scheduling and a couple emails to the city of Dayton that I was going to do it, you know, just so they weren't surprised and went out there and stayed with her um, because I get, I go there through a right of entry from the city of Dayton and she harvested graffiti off the right company factory about, a, about six weeks before it burnt. And she um, has created, and I don't know if I can get to the internet, I can show it to you. She has created jewelry using the graffiti of Wright Company Factory, you know, earrings, necklaces, rings, 
And then she sells it on her Instagram store and tags the heritage area in that, you know, this is the story, you know, thanks to Naha for allowing us to do this. She's also done the same thing for the arcade. So she, she already kind of had a method um, and, a, and a purpose. But when I saw her purpose, I saw that it could meet my purpose. So she wasn't reaching out to me. I was like, I see you. I like what you're doing. Do you want to come do more of what you're doing at my site? So um, don't know if any more jewelry is going to be made in the future. So limited edition. <laughs> new hashtag, <laughs> but no, thank you. Um, you know, we've also done promotions around, we're, we're working on, we're going to start working on a promotion around uh, a movie release. Uh, uh, let's see, we've done partnerships with libraries. Um, yeah. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, Mackenzie. Um, my question is, you said that don't wait for these opportunities to come to you, be more proactive. So what's your advice for someone who hasn't been doing community partnerships to get out there and be more proactive in finding those? That's a great question. I hope that I said in my presentation, you know, once you get going, you're like, oh, did I say that? Did I not say that? Um, if I, I think it, it comes down to work culture. and if you are in leadership, you need to allow your staff to do this work because part of it is showing up. And if you don't have the flexibility in your staffing schedule or your budget to allow you to come to Dayton for this conference, um, it's not gonna, you're just not gonna have as many opportunities. So maybe there's, you know, there's a wide spectrum of communities in this room. So maybe it's going to your chamber meetings. Maybe it's engaging with your county convention and visitors bureau, the travel and tourism. What other attractions do you have in your community? And, and I would say also like, who's doing cool stuff in your community? Like, you know who those are because they're, they're showing up on your social, they're showing up in the paper. And so what are they doing and how can you go and be part of that? And um, I don't know if that completely answers your question, but I spend a lot of time in conversations not knowing exactly what my role is and just listening. And sometimes it doesn't align, but there's no loss there. You know, there's no, I mean, other than a loss of, I mean, I don't even consider it a loss of time. Um, yeah, so maybe just start showing up, start watching. Um, I will be honest that it helps when there's a little money behind the opportunity and you might not have money in your budget to be part of community partnerships, but you know what you do have? You've got assets, you've got collections, you've got stories, you've got brains. <laughs> um, and guess what? We really need those. <laughs> Um, so maybe there's a role there where you can engage and say, Hey, you know, this is what I can bring to this. This is how I can help you achieve your goals. And it, it maybe comes down to what type of organization you're at. Oh, um, no. <laughs> Hard question. I, I actually serve on the board. So I feel like this is like a little bit of a buddy question. <laughs> you say a, a like layup question? I, but, um, you know, I know you have a small staff. It's you and a part-time person that's coming on board next week. Um, yeah. But you have a very strong board and great volunteers. And I just wonder, like, how do you find the right volunteers and, and you know, rely on them so much, you know, to, to lead that? You know, sometimes we have volunteers that, you know, might want, you know, come with, you know, want to help us so much, but just aren't the right fit or take a lot of time, but it, I feel like you use volunteers very well. Can you huh. tell me a little about that? Sure. <laughs> Can I tell you all the stories about bad volunteers? Because <laughs> those are much more interesting. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of joke. Um, thank you, Jane. That's really kind of you to say. And I will say that I was lucky enough to inherit um, a strong board. 
And that board has changed over time as we've been conscious about implementing our DEI policy. DEI policy. Um, uh, so it, it, has, it has changed a little bit in the eight years that I've been there slowly. Um, so we've been conscious about bringing people on the board who have the energy time resources to show up and represent the organization when I can't be there. There was an event this week that I had to be in Columbus and the governor was at the Boonshoft, so I had to send a board me member. Often that goes to our executive officers, but sometimes they can't do those things. So trying to think about who fits best in that kind of role. Um, maybe it's an oversimplification, but maybe it's about having a real relationship with them and knowing their strengths. Um, if you work with boards, you probably have some attorneys on those boards. Maybe you don't send the attorney to the ribbon cutting of the hot dog stand. I don't know, I'm making this up. Um, but maybe you send that attorney when there's a very um, nuanced conversation to be had. So some people are great in the ribbon cuttings and some people are great in the the uh, you know intense conversations. I'm sorry, Jane, I don't think that really answered your question other than to say, I feel like I, I know you and I, and I know your work and I love sitting at the table with you. Hi, Jen Haney Conifer from Warren County uh, Government. Just curious, you didn't really touch on this, but I'm just curious what kind of outreach you're doing with public schools and whatnot, if any. Sure. So there's a lot of conversations happening around the eclipse and how to engage the schools through the National Park Service Junior Ranger Program for the eclipse. Unfortunately, the eclipse is right at dismissal time. Yeah. So we're trying, that, that's a current problem that we're working on. In addition to that, something that touches the school is we're in a community partnership with the Dayton Foundation. Dayton Foundation is lead. And that's another thing is you don't always have to be the lead of every partnership. I actually like to just be a partner, not the lead. Um, Dayton Foundation is leading a STEM for all initiative, um, exploring outside of Montgomery County. And I don't know if that includes Warren County. I'd have to go to my notes but um, eight partners coming at the table to do a one-year assessment of STEM education for um, around um, ideas of career um, exposure and workforce development. I'm part of the team because I am representing the work that is carried out at our partner sites that are around STEM education. Um, so that will have impact. Um, they're looking at a collective impact model for that um, pilot program and assessment um, for STEM education across the region. So that would touch schools. They'll be partnering with Montgomery County Educational Service Center and um, Learn to Earn, some, some, some stuff around there. We have, um, you know, facilitated, most of our partners are doing that work. You know, the National Park engages with their no kids, their kids outdoor program. It's had like eight names. I can't remember which one it is now. <laughs> uh, whenever, when anytime the administration changes, all the names change. Um, and Carolyn Park has like 700 kids at their site yesterday. And um, all you have to do is drive by and see the buses and know that um, they're, they're really engaging. So that's a whole life thing. <laughs> but, um, so a lot of the, and the Air Force Museum is doing tremendous work around education. So to really answer that question, because I am maybe a federal grant administrator bringing the organizations together to collaborate and cooperate 
but the true work of the heritage area is done by the formal and informal partners. I'm not doing that. And that's why sometimes I have to like have a second to be like, okay, what's everyone doing? Okay, like let's talk about Air Camp. Air Camp is doing a ton in education. It's a summer camp aviation experience, you know, reaching kids across the country. Yeah. We can talk more about that if you'd like to. All right, is it snack time? It is. I think it is uh, time for a break, right? Great. Yeah, there's oh. no, no questions. No questions online? No. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. I'm going to hang around a little bit, and I'm going to take off. Thank you. OK, um, our next session will be a little bit of a informal uh, networking session, but also our poster session. Shout out to the Kent State High School, our diamond oh, sorry. <laughs> our diamond sponsor. Um, so they're going to be up there. We're going to give them a table. Um, so go chat with them, learn all about cool stuff. Um, also talk to each other, you know, digest what you just heard. <laughs> Any ideas, start, you know, start networking, make it good. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely.